Easter Sunday. I do want to lift up a couple of things. In your bulletin this morning, there is first a blue card. That card is important. We invite you to fill it out, register your attendance. On the back side is a place for you to share joys and concerns in your own life, things that you would invite the prayer team here at Cypress Creek to, to lift up, and that group takes them very seriously. Later in our service, as you come forward for communion, we invite you to drop those in the baskets. And if you're a first-time visitor with us, make sure that's the only thing you drop in. Your presence here is gift enough for this congregation. The second thing is the offering envelope, the special Easter Day offering. That supports our, the larger tradition, including uh, overseas ministry, as well as the new church development program that has started since 2000, more than 850 new churches in the United States. So some exciting work going on. So I hope you'll consider being generous to that special day offering. Well, earlier we heard the Easter text at the beginning of the service. This morning I want us to focus on Ephesians, the fourth chapter. This is Paul writing to the church of Ephesus. He says, you were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lusts, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. We are members of one another. You join me in prayer. On this joyous morning, we seek to hear again the good news of resurrection, to receive the gift that you offer us, O oh Lord a gift of life that is born out of death, a gift that will change our lives. Amen. Most of you are going to be too young to remember this, but in the comic books of my childhood, there were advertisements advertisements for all kinds of things that would draw the attention of a young boy. One of those advertisements was for X-ray vision glasses. I bought not one, but two pairs of those. When I bought them, they were $3 plus $1.50 for shipping and handling. Would you believe it? Both of those pairs were defective. <laughs> they did not do what they claimed to do, and it was only later glancing at the advertisement that I discovered something called fine print. I was eight years old. I did not have an attorney on retainer to read the small print of contracts. It said in that fine print provides the illusion of x-ray. The illusion. Well, I purchased the spy scope. I purchased the invisibility helmet. And would you believe neither one of those worked, at least as it was described in the advertisement. As a kid, you want to see the world differently. You want to put on some sort of special glasses, you want to put on some really unique helmet, you want to peer through a special telescope and all of a sudden have the world open up to you in a way that you had never seen before. And that's what I was seeking, but I did not find. How many of you have seen the TV series Undercover Boss? Something you all have seen, many of you? I mean, it's, it's an interesting show how the boss, the CEO of some large company, some corporation, chooses to become an employee, doing it undercover so that nobody recognizes him or her, to kind of 
get a feel of the business, to see what's going on, to see what employees are really saying when they don't think anybody is really paying attention. I'm fascinated how the removal of the executive clothing and the putting on of everyday work garments, putting on an apron, putting on whatever it is is worn in the plant, in the restaurant, or whatever the business is, suddenly allows that person to see and hear things differently. The same thing happened in the Vatican. Pope Francis has been leaving the Vatican every now and then, late at night, but first removing his pope attire and putting on the everyday dress of a priest, the black outfit, pants, jacket, the little white collar, the garments of an everyday priest, and going out on the streets and meeting the people of Rome. According to one insider, he goes out and meets the poor. He provides for them a meal and then likes to sit down and to listen to them, to hear their stories. And people speak differently when they are speaking to an ordinary priest versus the Pope. And it allows the Pope to see things differently, not from the the sheltered perspective of his office or title, but from that vantage point where he meets people in their ordinary lives, in the midst of their struggles and their frailties. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church at Ephesus, wants his readers to see things differently. He wants them to take off their old self and put on something new, a new self, a new identity in Christ, one in the likeness of God. Why? Paul answers that, so that in putting away the old self, we might speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are all members of one another. We are all members of one another. When Paul speaks about sharing this message with our neighbors, he's understanding that word as Jesus understood it, not some limited group of people that live within a block of you. He's talking about all who need to hear this glorious message. And yet to see that notion of neighbor that broadly, we need a different perspective. From the perspective of our old selves, Paul says, it's self-serving, it's deceiving, it's corrupt and greedy, but clothe yourself in the new self as a member of one another, as part of something bigger than ourselves, and suddenly things change. When we're just working from our own petty wants and desires, it limits us, but something happens. Something happens when we clothe ourselves with Christ and with his resurrection. Suddenly, we have this life-giving connection and this new sense of purpose. Earlier in the chapter, in verse 17, the apostle Paul says, you must no longer live as the Gentiles live in the futility of their minds. Another way of saying that word futility means void of purpose. In Ephesus, a worldly city, there was a lot going on, a lot of people beckoning others to come and to discover what the purpose they were trying to sell. But Paul says that is void of purpose, empty, a dead end. I think we know that because I think we've all tried on the spectacles akin to the x-ray glasses of the comic books. We've all tried the culture's version of the spy scope that claims to see where we otherwise could not see. We have tried the lenses of money and selfishness, bigotry and addiction, violence and get-rich schemes, yet we have found with each of them that there is fine print. And if we read it carefully, it says that it's nothing but an illusion. 
this Easter, I don't want you to miss the more. Don't miss the opportunity to see more of life and the world, to see things differently, to see your sisters and brothers as members of one another, to see us as a part of something bigger than ourselves. A friend of mine on Facebook wrote just over a week ago the following words. She said, you ever feel as if your life dreams are moving forward perfectly? And then something out of your control, someone else's bad decision, an unexpected interruption, and the path forward is utterly destroyed. And she went on to speak with such despair and hopelessness. It was for her a dead end. My fear is is that she is going to miss the more to miss the different perspective that comes from taking off the old self and clothing ourselves with something new, to clothe ourselves with Christ and his resurrection. Death sure appeared to be a dead end, but God offered an alternative path. Don't be confined to the futility of your minds, to this notion of a, of a, of a life void of purpose. But put on a new self, one that has no fine print. Instead, it has a bold, audacious, and visionary proclamation. Earlier, I talked about that special day offering, helping some of our global mission partners. And just this past week, I received an email with a prayer that comes from our mission partners in South and North Korea. Yes, we have mission partners in both South and North Korea, and they wrote this prayer jointly, and this is part of it. They wrote, give our weak selves the Holy Spirit. Let us not give up on our pursuit for forgiveness, reconciliation, and unification. Amidst the the despair of death, you, God, have shown us great hope through resurrection. Bring the new life of resurrection to this dying land. I love that third line, amidst the despair of death, you, Lord, have shown us great hope through resurrection. A new vision is offered, a vision that sees the more, that has embraced the more, a vision not trapped by the futility of people's minds, but one that has this new self, this resurrected garment that they are now wearing. I mean, you think about South and North Korea. You think about a situation that at least appears from our perspective to be hopeless, and yet I am left dumbfounded by those who speak about life and promise and possibility and hope in the face of violence and injustice. These are people that have clothed themselves with resurrection, with Christ and his life from death to empty tomb. I mean, it's a powerful statement. Peter Marshall Not the game show host, but the preacher from the early 1900s made a powerful statement. He wrote, the stone was rolled away from the door of the tomb, not to permit Christ to come out, but to enable the disciples to go in. The event of the resurrection was intended to be witnessed, to be seen and experienced. The world was changed not by the resurrection alone, but by those who claimed it for themselves, who took it on upon themselves, and then dared to dream, to be a part of something that is greater than themselves, to dare to dream the bold and audacious dream of God. In the early part of the second century, we have have stories about baptisms among the early Christians. And in those days, as people would approach the lake or the river or the stream, they would take off all their clothes, enter into the waters, and be baptized. 
there was no need for x-ray glasses in those days. And I'm glad we have changed that because that would be, in my opinion, a little awkward. But as they would come out of the water, they would be given a new garment, a white garment. And they could look back across the lake or across the river and they could see their old clothes, their old self lying there. And now they were covered with something new and glorious. I love the image, though. And quite often when I'm getting ready to share in a baptism, I will tell the person who is to be baptized to, to come to church already wearing whatever you're going to wear under your baptismal garment, a swimsuit, shorts, a white t-shirt. And if it's cold, throw on some sweatpants, a sweatshirt. Just carry with you the clothes that you're going to change into. And quite often people are bringing in some new outfit they've yet to wear. Because what I love is after the baptism, as they come out of their changing room in that new outfit, their hair still wet from the waters of baptism, they literally have to step over their sweatpants and their old garments as they are stepping into this, this new life, as they have allowed Christ to clothe them with something new and powerful. Back in the mid-1990s, on an Easter Sunday, I was doing about four or five baptisms before I went in to preach. The first young man I baptized, his name was Mark. By the time I got out of the baptistry and into the changing room to change, I was trying to get everything on real quickly, and I stepped out of, out of the changing room, and there stood Mark in front of the mirror in his new Easter clothes. He looked at himself and said, I look great. And then echoing the words of Billy Crystal, he said, I look marvelous. <laughs> and before I could say anything, his baptismal mentor spoke up and said, Mark, you do look great. But be reminded that because you've been in the waters of baptism, as you look around, everyone looks great. Everyone looks beautiful because everyone around you is a gift of God. And now, because you have been in the waters, you see that. And I'm hearing his mentor share this as I'm about ready to go in and preach my Easter sermon. And I'm thinking to myself, this is better stuff. <laughs> and it was. And as I straightened up my tie and made sure my collar was buttoned down, I felt like I was clothed with something new. I felt as if I was clothed with the good news of Christ's resurrection, that I was a part of something wonderful. And I could see not just Mark looking wonderful, but as I looked out upon that congregation, I saw people who were beautiful and wonderful, a group of people that had been clothed with Christ and his resurrection and were desiring to be, to be part of something bigger than themselves, to not be caught in the futility of their minds, to live a life void of purpose, but to embrace that wonderful purpose that we are each a part of one another and that that is the message that we discover when we are clothed with Christ. When we take on his resurrection, it is no longer a life lived for self, but for others, a life that is lived with and for God today on this Easter Sunday. That is my hope for each of us, that we will look at the garments we have on and see them as the garments of resurrection, to see ourselves, yes, looking good, even marvelous, but to also see those around us looking equally beautiful and wonderful because that's what God wants. And it is that plan that God is inviting us to participate in, to begin to dare to dream the God, the, the dream that God has for all the world. You join me in prayer. On this Easter morning, we welcome you, O Lord of life. We welcome you and your gift of the resurrected Christ. Not only do we welcome you into our service, but we welcome you into our lives anew. We, we, we welcome your resurrection, for it is life-changing, life-giving, and life-sustaining.
We welcome the hope it brings to our world. We welcome the joy it brings to our darkness. We welcome the empty tomb, for we know that it means your dream. Your dream for this world is not dead, but alive and at work. It is alive for us to discover and embrace. It is alive for us to accept and utilize. It is alive for us to find empowerment so that we might dream alongside you, O Lord, to dream about a world where we all see one another as partners, as a part of something great and wonderful and transformative. O Lord God, bring your gift of resurrection into this space. Allow your living spirit to give hope to those who are mired in despair, who feel as if they are sitting at a dead end. For today is the day you announce once again new life, resurrection. Allow us this day to not only hear that story, but to prepare ourselves to announce it as those who have allowed that gift to come over us, as we have been clothed in it, allow us to be grace-filled people who proclaim your dream. And not just a few, but all of us are beautiful and wonderful in your eyes. Dare us to dream that dream. Dare us to dream as you dream of a new life, with new possibilities. We offer all this in the name of the one that death could not hold, Jesus Christ.